Shortly after the release of The Incredible Melting Man, writer-director Bill Sachs was contacted by the studio Crown International Pictures. This led to him writing and directing the film Van Nuys Boulevard, which was released in 1979. The movie was a modest hit thanks to it coming out quickly while cruising was still popular, before the police shut it down. Since they now had a working relationship, Crown asked Sachs to do another movie for them. This time, they wanted a western. Sachs looked into it and began to work on a script while trying to scout some locations. He then started looking at what was playing at the local theaters and noticed something. Westerns were no longer a thing. Since they were making a western, they are going to have to build sets, and Sachs thought, why not something else? Thanks to the overwhelming success of movies like Star Wars and Alien, sci-fi films were very popular. The director suggested that instead of making a western, for them to make a sci-fi western. Also, since everyone else was making straight sci-fi, he thought it would be a better idea to make a sci-fi parody. That goofed on all the recent trends in the genre. This felt right since he did The Incredible Melting Man, which was a tongue-in-cheek homage to horror, and now he was moving on to make a parody homage of sci-fi. The studio liked the idea and told him to go ahead with it. He wrote a script about space cowboys, cops that were in charge of a certain sector of the galaxy. They pulled people over for speeding and whatnot. They get sent on a new mission to travel to another world and find the Blue Star. A magic gem that holds unlimited power. Traveling with the crew is Galaxina, a stunning robot assistant. The cast consisted of Stephen Macht in his first leading role as Sergeant Thor, J.D. Hinton as Buzz, and Avery Schreiber as Captain Cornelius Butt. Schreiber was a comedic actor who had done numerous roles in television and movies, but at the time he was known for an ongoing series of Doritos commercials. Especially when you taste nacho cheese flavored Doritos, because they taste mm. as good as mm. they crunch. The character of the robot Galaxina was meant to be the perfect woman. The problem now was finding an actress who could be that. They had an open casting in Hollywood and saw hundreds of actresses and models, but none of them were right for the part. The director wanted someone who was not only beautiful, but also one that was unique. It was getting near the end of casting, and the director had two that stood out from the rest, Patty Hansen and Connie Selica. On the last day of casting, Dorothy Stratton walked in. She was one of the most beautiful women any of them had ever seen. Sachs immediately knew she was the one. As for the crew, there was a lot of talent that came on board. Georgie Mather was a producer, who was just the production supervisor for the miniature and optical special effects for Star Wars. He put together the effects team, some of which also worked on Star Wars. He brought in John Carl Beekler to do some of the modeling work. Dean Cundy, who frequently worked with John Carpenter, was the DP. He just finished shooting Rock and Roll High School and The Fog. Another John Carpenter regular was his friend, composer Alan Howorth. He was in charge of the sound effects for the movie. Chris Wayless was hired for the special makeup effects. Peter Curran, who did the opticals and miniatures on Star Wars, did the laser effects for the shootout. The director worked with the effects team and told them about what he wanted for the spaceships. One day he was in a grocery store and was trying to think about the main ship, the police cruiser Infinity. He saw something that immediately sparked his interest. He took it back to the effects team and said, This is what I want the Infinity to look like. And it was a Jerusalem artichoke. He explained he didn't want this thing exactly, but for it to be a long ship with these tiny bubbles on the sides. They designed the ship to his specifications. For the other ship in the movie, he wanted it shaped like a bird. Alan Howorth did all the bird sounds. Filming was going to take place on the Paramount Ranch, as well as some local sound stages they would use for the interiors of the spaceship. At one point, the studio decided they wanted the film to be R, so they added in some swears and nudity. Although Stratton wasn't allowed to have any nudity. She was Playboy's Miss August 1979, and as such... She was under contract to not have nudity anywhere else. To make up for this, they poured her into a skin-tight white jumpsuit. The first time Stephen Mock saw Stratton was at the costume fitting. He was stunned not only by her looks, but by how tall she was. She was 5'10", and he was 5'11". Feeling a little self-conscious, he went to the director and said it was really important for his character to have boots to give him more of an imposing presence. The director went to the producers and said, We need some bigger boots because our lead actor is too short. While still in pre-production, they ran into an unexpected problem. 
Director Peter Bogdanovich had cast Stratton for his upcoming film. They all laughed. Since Galaxina was getting ready to start filming, he tried to get Stratton to leave the production. He wanted to be the one to discover her, and not this dumb low-budget spoof. He kept telling her not to do it and pressured the studio. He even went to Playboy to try to get them to pressure her to not do the movie. She was loyal to Galaxina, though. She genuinely wanted to do the part, and even had the vanity plate Galaxina made up for her car. Beyond the movie, Bogdanovich had other intentions for the actress. Chris Wallace was designing the aliens for the film, but the work was exhausting. They needed 50 different aliens for the movie, but only gave him a month to deliver. He made 15 new aliens, and modified the rest from old masks and suits from previous productions. Filming started in early 1980. The studio couldn't make up their mind if they wanted the film to be R or PG, so they had them do two takes of scenes with swears, one with the curses, and another without. The interiors they filmed in Raleigh Studios in Hollywood. At the time, they were experiencing some of the worst weather L.A. had to offer. It was a constant downpour, and as such, the sets were leaking. They had to go up on the roof and create a series of troughs to divert the water so it would stop leaking on the set. Because of this, the shoot ran into delays. They lost three days because of the rain, but the producers refused to give them more time. Instead of adding days to the shoot, one of the producers took the script and just ripped out a few pages. Now they had to film the movie in less time, with some of the story missing, and still have it make sense. With the shortened timeline, they could only do things in one or two takes. They had a very small effects team, who did almost all the visuals and camera. There was only one computer effect, and that was the billboard at the beginning. For Galaxina's chair, they took a mold of the actress, so that she fit right in. The director wanted it to light up, and Cundy suggested they cover it with scotch light paint. The paint looks normal, but if you shine light on it, it reflects it back. There were a few scenes that were written to include holograms. The director looked into it and thought, why do we need this to be 3D when film is 2D? Dean Cundy suggested doing it the old-fashioned way, with a mirror shot. They filmed the scenes, purposefully muddied up the look, and then projected the footage off a semi-transparent mirror to give it this look. This was a technique they used in the black hole. Since the movie was a spoof of sci-fi, they had more than a few jokes in it. The opening crawl was an obvious nod to Star Wars. The cryogenic sleep chambers, like an alien, as well as the captain giving birth. Mr. Spot, the bartender, is an obvious goof on Star Trek, and more like the captain's logs. Infinity Log, Galaxy Date 3008.15, Captain Cornelius Butt, entry number 1737. All the jokes from Captain Butt were from the director's uncle. He used to tell dad jokes all the time, and the director felt they were something that the captain would say. Further into filming, there was another unexpected problem. Stratton's husband, Paul Snyder, insisted on coming to the set each day. The couple had been married less than a year, and he was now her manager, chauffeur, and acting coach. Snyder met Stratton while she was a teenager working at Dairy Queen in Vancouver. He convinced her to pose for Playboy, and also persuaded her to move to Los Angeles, where the two got married. He was a very odd man. He hardly spoke. He would just stand off to the side and stare at Stratton. When he wasn't there, she was talkative and cheerful, but every time he arrived, she clammed up and was visibly nervous. She couldn't even act when he was around. On top of this, he walked around with spurs on his cowboy boots, which made a lot of noise. Infuriated, the director had him banned from the set because he was a huge distraction. Most mornings, Stratton would come to the set crying. The director had lunch with her every day, and she told him about her husband. She said that he was often very mean and treated her really badly. Snyder was a foreign national living in the U.S. without a green card, so he legally couldn't get a job. Without a regular job, he relied on her to pay for everything. With him being banned from the set, they were able to get the shoot back to normal. The director wanted the planet Altair 1 to have an unusual look. They didn't have money to do any more visual effects, so he suggested filming the day scenes with infrared ectochrome film. This film was used briefly in Apocalypse Now. The film captures heat instead of light and is very, very hard to work with. Everyone at the studio fought the director over this. Kodak, the film supplier, did too. Kodak told them they'd only sell them 50,000 feet of the film, which was way more than they needed. 
They found someone who bought the film previously but didn't use it all, so they purchased what they had left over. The film had to be kept frozen until shortly before filming. Stratton also had to have special makeup applied because with the film, you could see through her skin. It didn't matter for the others since they were all wearing masks. They shot the scenes and ran into another problem. No one would develop the film. After you process the film, it leaves behind a residue that ruins the developing fluid. After some searching, they were able to find a lab that agreed to do it. The way they did it was after the fluid is used for a few days, they'd have to throw out the stuff and start with a clean new batch. They agreed to develop the film on the last day before dumping the fluid. When the crews go into the space brothel, the director wanted them to all sing a song together. Shriver said, let's sing Porno Patrol. And Mox said, no, Horno Patrol. The director said, whatever. So one says porno and the other says horno. For the western town, they used the set on the Paramount Ranch, most likely the same one that was used on Scream. Much like how producer Sam Gelfman wanted to be killed in The Incredible Melting Man, one of Galaxina's producers, Marilyn Tenzer, wanted her head to be served on a platter. The director obliged. Some of the masks used in the brothel were borrowed from Star Wars. Rhonda Shear from USA Up All Night was one of the party aliens. Ordrick was an intentional spoof on Darth Vader. As another goof, they rented the Batmobile to be on the Western set. It didn't run, so they just had some aliens working on it. The director did some work in Italy, and since this movie was a space western, it had to have a shootout. He did this scene as an homage to spaghetti westerns and Sergio Leone. He even used sounds from many of those movies. He wanted a big orchestral score for the scene, but they couldn't afford it, so he just used some stock music. The biker cult dancing was an homage to 50s beach movies. Chopper, the leader of the biker cult, was played by Stephen Morell. He was also a biker in Van Nuys Boulevard. His real name was Mark Rosen, but he changed it in the 60s to Aesop Aquarian when he joined the Manson family. Thankfully, he recognized things were getting strange, so he got out of there before the criminal activity started. He then changed his name to Stephen Morell and became an actor. The telescope is located behind the power station in Silmar. It's used for viewing the sun. The interior of the spaceship is the same location they used in The Incredible Melting Man. For the final captain's log, the director told Schreiber just to improvise. Where are we? What is this? Uh, space. Uh, uh, entry number... Uh, this is Corny Butt. Is this Philadelphia? Filming was supposed to be 20 days, but due to the problems with the weather, they only shot for 17. The director said everyone had a good time making the movie. It was a little hectic at times, and they didn't have enough days, but overall, it was enjoyable and not as exhausting as The Incredible Melting Man. While editing the film, the producers still couldn't make up their minds. One day they said the movie should be R, so they edited it with swears and nudity. The next they said, no, PG, so they had to remove the offending material. The next day they said, nope, R. This went on for quite some time until they finally agreed to release it as R. Now with filming over, Stratton was getting ready to go to New York for the filming of They All Laughed with Peter Bogdanovich. Snyder wanted to go with Stratton to New York for the shoot, but she told him Bogdanovich was doing a closed set where only the immediate cast and crew would be allowed in. So Stratton went to New York, and Snyder stayed back in L.A. Immediately after arriving in New York, Stratton began her affair with Bogdanovich. In late April, Stratton was crowned Playboy's Playmate of the Year during a party at the Playboy Mansion. She then went on a weeks-long publicity tour to promote her being Playmate of the Year, as well as her upcoming movies. Her husband, being her manager still, did some shady things to make sure all the publicity money went to him and not her. She continued her affair with Bogdanovich and filed for divorce. Snyder emptied their joint bank account and hired a private investigator to gather proof of her affair. Without a job, Snyder was running out of money, so he sold off all of Stratton's Playmate of the Year prizes. Crown started marketing Galaxina, which upset Bogdanovich. He attacked the film since they labeled it starring Playmate of the Year Dorothy Stratton. He said this was merely reducing her to nothing but a sex object, and she would have trouble being taken seriously as an actress. It was now July, and filming of They All Laughed had finished. Stratton met with Snyder to tell him she had fallen in love with Bogdanovich and wanted a divorce. Roughly a week later, on August 14th, 
Stratton had a meeting with her business manager about the settlement she'd offer her estranged husband that afternoon. The manager tried to convince her to have a lawyer handle it, but she wanted to see him one last time because she was hoping, after all this was over, they could remain friends. That night, Snyder's roommates returned to the house. They saw Stratton's car out front, and since Snyder's bedroom door was closed, they figured the couple wanted some privacy. Hours later, Snyder's private detective contacted the roommates, who checked in the bedroom and discovered the bodies of Stratton and Snyder. According to the police report, Snyder shot Stratton point-blank in the head with a 12-gauge shotgun within an hour of her arrival. Then, an hour later, he turned the gun on himself. Both bodies were nude and Dorothy had been raped at least once. Bogdanovich was devastated. He was so overwhelmed he had to be sedated. In a sad twist of fate, Galaxina opened the same day as Dorothy Stratton's death. News got out about the actress's death and Galaxina was pulled from theaters the next day. Stratton's body was cremated and her remains were buried at Westwood Village Memorial Park Cemetery in Los Angeles. In late 1981, 20th Century Fox held test screenings of They All Laughed. The results were so bad, the studio dropped the film. Bogdanovich spent $5 million reacquiring the film so he could distribute it himself. The movie was a massive failure, pulling in less than $1 million in its run. Bogdanovich said because of his grief, he wasn't thinking clearly at the time, and with the huge financial loss, he had to declare bankruptcy. About three months after Stratton's death, Galaxina went back into theaters. Bogdanovich was enraged, saying they were trying to profit on her death when really... They were just re-releasing the film to try to recoup the money they lost since they pulled the film months prior. Crown published a statement saying they had gone to great pains and much expense to avoid exploiting her death. They didn't sensationalize her passing by changing her billing to something like the late Dorothy Stratton. The poster and her billing were unchanged from what Playboy and Dorothy Stratton agreed upon prior to her untimely death. The movie received bad reviews from the likes of Siskel and Ebert but it still went on to do well financially. On November 1st, 1981, NBC premiered the made-for-TV movie Death of a Centerfold, The Dorothy Stratton Story, with Jamie Lee Curtis as Stratton. In 1981, The Village Voice published Death of a Playmate, an article about Stratton that went on to win a Pulitzer Prize. This became the foundation for the movie Star 80 by Bob Fosse, although his version focused more on the husband and how much of a scumbag he was. It also took some liberties with what really happened. For some strange morbid reason, they filmed the murder-suicide scenes in the same apartment where the real crime took place. Bogdanovich was furious about this and refused to allow his name to be used in the film. Fosse created the character Aram Nicholas and based him on Bogdanovich, who threatened to sue if he didn't like the way the character was handled. Eric Roberts played Snyder in Star 80. Sachs said he was nothing like the real guy. The real Snyder never even spoke. He just gave everyone what he called death eyes. He was a creepy, weird guy that nobody wanted around, especially Dorothy. Sachs said Bruce White's portrayal of Snyder in Death of a Centerfold was much closer to the real thing. Bogdanovich lambasted Star 80, calling it inaccurate and a piece of shit. Overwhelmed with grief, Bogdanovich began writing The Killing of a Unicorn, the biography of Dorothy Stratton. In the book, he makes all sorts of claims, like how she was tortured on the set of Galaxina, which the director profusely denies. He claimed that in the scene where she was tied to the telescope, she was up there all night freezing, and the director refused to let her down. The director said she was never tied. There was a crew member out of frame who was holding the ropes and would let them go loose in between takes. They also had a down coat she wore to keep her warm when they weren't filming. They went out of their way to keep her happy, and she genuinely had a great time on the shoot. Bogdanovich also claimed Hugh Hefner attempted to rape her while she was at the Playboy Mansion. Hefner threatened to sue him, which is why in the book he used seduce instead of rape. Nearly every review of the book was negative. Roger Ebert empathized with Bogdanovich and said he could understand why he felt the need to write the book, but I wish he hadn't published it. Shortly after Dorothy's death, Bogdanovich allegedly started grooming her 13-year-old sister, Louise. Seven years later, after paying for her private schooling and modeling classes, he married her at the age of 20. It made all the tabloids. In 2001, 13 years later, 
they were divorced. Galaxina is a funny, oddball sci-fi spoof that's almost undone by, what else? Studio meddling. The pages that were torn out contained many of the comedic bits and would have helped to make the film flow better. As it is, they had to make some filler, which ended up causing the middle of the film to be somewhat dull and unfunny. Although, there's some solid jokes in the film, like how the alien thinks Captain Bud is his mother. Still, it's an interesting and occasionally funny spoof. Without the cuts, the movie might have been a great sci-fi parody. As it stands, it's a silly, flawed movie that's probably better enjoyed if you're slightly inebriated. It's also, sadly, a comedy that has one of the most tragic stories attached. So we meet at last, Ordric from Mordric. You are very beautiful for an automaton. And what about you, baby? Take off your mask and let me see your face. This is my face. <laughs> oh, sorry. 